You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. All right, well, I'm really apologetic, guys, for unleashing the last three chapters of this book on you this past week. That is some parched ground. (laughs) That is some parched ground. So we probably won't spend an hour talking about this as we have been prior, unless we really get cranking here. But just as a a summary and overview, we're in chapter 36, of course, with... uh, Jürgen Moltmann, I wanted to point out a couple of things about this, these guys. So first, uh, the um, contributions of dead Germans to the theology of it all is just, it's just dismal. What comes out of German theological training, it is awful. And anyway, we've got some fine examples of it here with uh, Jürgen Moltmann. So, as has been our habit, (laughs) what can we say positively about Mr. Moltmann? Other than this, he's still alive. He's 97 years old, still alive. I just checked this morning, unless Wikipedia has yet to been updated. Yeah. (laughs) Since 1926 when he was born? Yeah. Yeah, there is still hope for him. But, yeah, he's very old. Very old man. Okay, so. Right. Okay, so yes, that's a positive. So he does postulate that God is actively involved in his world. So, we appreciate that. He has an interesting um, theological grid. Did you pick that up? Through which he approaches his understanding of God and what God is about and so forth. It was on page 259, 258, I guess. Yeah, the quote is on 259, but the, but it's introduced there in uh, his contribution on 258, Theology of Hope, 1964. So what was that? What, what was his grid that he approached theology through? Eschatology. Eschatology. And eschatology is what? It's it's the theology of the end, right? The end times and the kingdom of God. So that was his interpretive grid. Okay. So we notice there, then uh, further down in that same paragraph, liberalism talked about the kingdom of God, but had it it had nothing to do with God or Jesus Christ reigning on earth in the future. It was just an ideal human society on earth. So he did not postulate that. So looking for anything, you know, that we could say positive about him, that would be positive. A little closer to the truth. Okay. We still shanked it in the bushes, but yeah. He is like a ping pong ball. Yeah, he's like a golf ball in a tile bathroom. Yeah, he's just everywhere. He is everywhere on this. Yeah, so he rejected classical liberalism, right? We'll say that's that's positive. He was influenced by whom that you guys looked at last week? Karl Barth, right? Founder of neo-orthodoxy or new orthodoxy. So he was positively affected by um, Bart, even though Bart certainly did not go far enough. Okay. Again, notice um, his conclusion here. And again, I don't want to get lost in, in Moltmann. The eschatological theology of Moltmann, page 261, was appealing to many th- uh, theologians because it seemed to be middle ground. Why is it people always want middle ground, huh? It's terrible. Can't we all just get along? Yeah, the Rodney King theology. 
It seemed to be middle ground between historic orthodoxy, whose gods seemed too remote, uninvolved, and unaffected by the world, and liberal theology, whose god was very interested in the world, but also nearly identified and trapped in it. Okay? So. Right. Right. Indeed. So that would be the critique of liberal theology, right? Is that orthodox theology emphasizing the transcendence of God makes God remote. It's a failure to understand orthodoxy for sure, but that is their that is their allegation. Okay? So he was looking for this more middle ground. Okay, what what um what did he think about Salvation, redemption, that sort of, yes, yes, exactly. Again, on 261, this hope for the future seems to be more than just Christians. Rather, it is for everyone, indeed, every, even the material world itself, which, okay, is there any biblical support for the idea of the material world experiencing a redemption? Any? Romans 8? Yeah? The recreation? Okay. That is, most men seems to favor, and here it is, universalism. That all will be saved in the end, and the world itself will be resurrected and transformed. Oh, that it were true. Oh, that it were true. Why do these guys, and, and all three for tonight, all fall into universalism. Why? What drives them there? Let's assume they're not um, unserious thinkers. I think that would be to do them an, an injustice, to, to think they're stupid or they don't seriously think about stuff or anything like that. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. So to jettison verbal plenary inerrancy, verbal plenary inspiration and and the derivative doctrine of inerrancy cuts you loose from God. Right. Right. What was Bart's approach? I, you guys talked about it last week, I'm sure. What was Bart's approach to Scripture? How did he understand Revelation? Remember? Because it flows. Yes. It becomes the Word of God to us. It's not an objective word of God. It becomes the word of God to us. It becomes the revelation of God to us. That's Bart. Um, be well familiar with that idea. It has completely infected evangelicalism. Be well familiar with the idea, uh, with Bart's idea of, of revelation. Yep. S some way, somehow, yep. Try to weasel around it. Right, I and mean, these are all World War II vets or survivors in one form or another. So yes, they have experienced evil at a profound level, and instead of humbling them before God, it sent them on a search for an answer that doesn't include God in a sense. Yeah, Thomas, you had something to say. That's why we're so narrow that we can see through a keyhole with both eyes at the same time. That's right. Yeah, because narrow is the way. Narrow is the gate. Yep. Okay. German Reformed. Notice that. German Reformed. Okay. Chapter 37. Karl Ratner. Chew. He is um, passed into the presence of his judge. He died in 1984. Okay. Well, what can we say about... Ratner. The Roman Catholic? Yep. Yes. So he ends up in universalism as well, the same kind of approach. Right? So he denied authority as well. Whose authority did he deny? The church's authority. Yeah. The church's authority. That's right. So Moltmann was German Reformed, and he denied the authority of Scripture. Ratner. Uh, um, denies the authority of the of the church over him a couple hundred years earlier. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. 
So he was very significant in the contemporary expressions of Roman Catholicism. Why? Yeah. Okay, so the anonymous Christian, great, let's hang on to it. Um, that wasn't what I was fishing for. <laughs> so, okay, right. Mm-hmm, right. So he provided the theological lift for Vatican II. Okay, Vatican II. Remember, we looked at Vatican II a little bit here a couple of weeks back, and it's reviewed for you here in this in this chapter. There are five changes made by Vatican II, page 264. Profound changes, our author says. I don't know that I would agree with it being profound changes. In fact, I'm penciled in my margin window dressing. But here they are. Uh, first, the Mass is no longer celebrated. It could now be celebrated in the language of the people, no longer Latin exclusively. Okay, doesn't mean anybody understands it. It just means they understand the words. Two, opportunity for the lady to be involved in the affairs of the church, no longer the clergy exclusively. A more significant three, new openness to the possibility of salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, we're going to circle back to that um, probably in two weeks to um, what's called Evangelicals and Catholics Together, ETC. And in evangelical Catholic ecumenicalism can be traced back to that. For a more positive attitude towards Eastern Orthodoxy and Protestantism, even more amazingly toward non-Christian religions. And then five, next paragraph, the opportunity for Catholic theologians to be more creative and innovative in their research and scholarship. That's what we like, theologians who are innovative and creative in their theology. <laughs> yes, they color outside the lines. How was he received by the Catholic Church? Yes. Yep, he had a big place at the table at Vatican II for sure. They rejected his doctoral dissertation. That's right. He had to change schools. So not everybody was inclined towards these things. And it, and there has been a resurgent of what they call historic, uh, even fundamental Catholicism over the last 20 plus years, where they're trying to overturn some of this, these changes in Catholicism. They think they've gotten away from the true mother church. Okay. All right. So we have on page 267, Aaron, what was that you introduced to us, that concept? The anonymous Christian. What in the world is the anonymous Christian? That's another one shanked in the bushes. <laughs> Uh, right right yeah so the idea is if if you have a moral code and you live in accordance with your moral code that you demonstrate that that you are an anonymous christian and that you're ultimately going to to go to heaven based on the grace of god in christ is what he would say um because you've, you've lived in accordance with your moral code. So what's wrong with that idea? Well, other than it's wrong, <laughs> has anyone lived in accordance with their moral code? Isn't that the fundamental problem? Thank you. That, he said Jesus did. That is the Sunday school answer. That's correct. What did you learn today? Jesus. Yeah, there you go. That's constantly fluctuating. Yes. Right? Isn't that our fundamental problem? We don't live we don't live consistent with any moral code. Not God's, not our own. <laughs> it is it is a very nebulous, flexible, 
kind of thing, we are masters at making excuse and redefining things. So, there is none. No, not one, right? Okay. So, it leads to universalism again, right? So, that's what we have. Now we have Catholic universalism, right? What does that do to evangelism, by the way? What does the concept of universalism do to evangelism? Kills it. Kills it. Why, why do you need to evangelize if everyone is going to make it in the end? Why would you suffer? Why would, why would the apostles, the disciples, have died martyrs' deaths if everyone's going to make it anyway? What, that does, that's, doesn't make any sense. It just completely guts the gospel. Yes? Yeah, that's right. Two ditches. Equally pernicious. Yep, for sure. Okay. <laughs> well, Gustavo Gutierrez. Whew. Still alive. Still alive. A Peruvian. Catholic. So we're introduced now to someone from South America for the first time. Okay, Peruvian. Okay, so what is Gutierrez known for? Liberation theology. Yeah. Okay, somebody want to take a whack at defining liberation theology for us? Thank you. That is the short answer <laughs> yeah that's the foundation of it for sure the study of me is god yeah what is what is liberation theology what problem is it seeking to address let's start with that poverty oppression yeah unequal power structures um t just taking advantage and so forth what's the history of south america Poverty, oppression, dominance by a very select few. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's, that's indisputable. So what was Gutierrez's kind of response to all of this? How did he, how did he tweak the gospel? Yeah, interesting, wasn't it? Yes, the, the, he said that there's the presumption that the oppressed are in the right and, and favored in the eyes of God. Okay? You think that, does that sound like the scripture to you? What do you think? Say what? Make a scrapbook. <laughs> That's that's well said, yeah. Yeah. Or Gavin Newsom using him in support of abortion. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. So we see on page two seventy two, rejection of single meaning. So now we've we've gone into a free for all. Scripture's now a, a piece of silly putty, you know, rubber nose, make it wax nose, make it whatever you want. So he, he tweaks it in that way. Talks about context. Right? All theology, bottom page 272, is shaped by its cultural context. Okay, is that true? Yeah. This is the danger in theology for all of us, is to, to interpret it, to to conceive our theology in our own cultural settings. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Liberation theologians have concluded that this poverty is due to the sinful structures of society. Does that sound familiar to you, by the way? It ought to. We are awash in liberation theology. Can you think of any contemporary expressions of it? BLM. Absolutely. Yes. 
Black Lives Matter. Absolutely. That is that is liberation theology come here, packaged, sent out. The idea that the poor are always the favored class before God, how does that play itself out in society over the last few years? <laughs> Mostly peaceful protests. What 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 happens to those that destroy property and all the rest of that sort of thing? Yeah, if they're if they're even picked up, they're you know bailed quickly and back out. And because why? Because fundamentally they are not in the wrong. Right? Sometimes we think these people are crazy. Like they say, ah, it's just crazy. Well, yeah, at one level I get it. It is, but it's it's not like they belong in insane asylum type crazies. There's a there's a demonic theological underpinning for all of this. It is Marxism. And the atonement is reparations, yeah. No. No, you'll never be. It's a constant payment, yeah. Can you think about so so Black Lives Matter contemporary expression? Any other contemporary expressions of liberation theology here? Protected class, yeah. Okay, so feminism is a contemporary expression of liberation theology. Yeah, yeah. It's it's all here. See, see. That's why ideas of consequences. I, I'm I'm not sure I'm following the connection. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm not conversant enough in his theology and so forth to to make any kind of direct connections connections like that. There's been lots of false messiahs come and go, for sure. Okay. How about this on page 275? The fourth common theme in liberation theology is that orthopraxy, right doing, is more important than orthodoxy, right thinking. Christian practice trumps Christian doctrine. What's wrong with that? Yeah, scripture alone. I mean, the answer becomes is who can decide what is Christian doctrine or Christian practice without Christian doctrine? And you can't. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So they use words that are familiar to us, but they have different meanings. It's not possible. It's not possible. We all have presuppositions that we begin with, and they too. Yep. That's right. Okay. So let's see. Is there anything else we need to... No, that's probably enough. I think we scratched around in the dry dirt long enough and haven't come up with much seed. So, okay, next week is the, we finish the book. All right, so let me just forewarn you so nobody, you know, like pops a gasket here. So we're going to read about Rosemary Radford Ruther, I guess is how it's said. Feminist theologian, that one will be delightful. You'll like it. Guaranteed you'll like it. Okay. And then we do finish with Carl F. H. Henry. So so we do we come up out of the mud to close. Okay. So remember, um, the premise of this book is that these are very influential people, not always for good. <laughs> not always for good. Okay? So blessings on you men for hanging in. I know a few of you were uh, tried in your souls over such things. That's you good to read things that, that you just completely don't agree with. Okay, not a lot of it, because okay, that would become a waste of time. 
but you know, a few pages now and again. It's good. It helps you feel alive. <laughs> or sick. <laughs> or sick. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. When you're vomiting, you feel you feel alive. <laughs> Indeed. All right. So, let's see. 638. It's too early for a break. So, let's turn over to page 26 in your syllabus. We have got to make some progress. But we're in good shape, because once we're not talking about the book at all, when we're just in the syllabus, we will find our way to the end. Okay, so we're on page 26. You guys spent time with Luther. That was good. Old, old Martin Luther. We now turn to Ulrich Zwingli. Is there any way to darken that screen a little bit? Maybe? That was a mistake. There we go. Okay. So there's a portrait of Zwingli, a stout young lad. Okay. So Zwingli, 1484 to 1531, died young. Remember how he died? He died in battle. Yep, he was killed in battle. Okay. By the way, it'd be a great name to have on your 100 dates from history. By the way, how many of you are actually planning to do this? <laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay. I just wondered how many of them I'm going to have to read, because I will read them all and interact with you at some level on them. Okay, good. So they will be due. No, not like the present. They're due the first Monday in May. The first Monday in May. Okay? So we are meeting next Monday night. That's the last in April. The first Monday in May, and then the 8th, and then we're done for the summer. Okay? So there's only three more after this. So they are due in, in two more. Okay? That gives me a week to read them all and get it back to you on the last night. Then I'm not chasing you across the church on Sunday mornings trying to find you to give it to you. Okay? Fair enough. All right. So, the life of Ulrich Zwingli is one of sharp contrasts. His conversion to Christianity seems to have come sometime 1516 to 1519, somewhere in there. Deeply impressed by Erasmus's humanism, he began to study and preach directly from the Greek text. That was un unprecedented unprecedented for a thousand years right it's hard for us to conceive of that period of time elapsing and to have been separated from the text for that period of time but true for the next 10 years he was the pastor of the main church in zurich switzerland he dis he disregarded the catholic lectionary so the lectionary is what um, spells out the preaching calendar within the catholic church which passages are to be read and then preached from, began to preach expositorily, beginning with the Gospel of Matthew. Expository preaching produces change because it brings people in direct contact with the Word of God. It removes the intermediaries. During this time, he gathered around himself several young men with whom he met and studied the Greek New Testament on a weekly basis. This was discipleship. Okay? This was man-to-man -man discipleship. These same men later became known as Anabaptists, became his bitter enemies. This is why we say he's one of sharp contrasts. All of these reformers are, are, are massively conflicted, massively conflicted men. Zwingli is no different. Luther, you know, Luther and his anti-Semitism, Calvin and his approach to Servetus and some of the other issues, Zwingli and his approach to his, his former disciples, and these guys are, are just massively conflicted, huge blind spots, okay? Just like us. He became his bitter enemies when they urged on him reforms contrary to what the civil authorities 
would allow. So here's this is the important thing. So Ingley's idea of how to best go about reforming the church was to preach against its abuses, wait for someone to complain about the preaching, and then submit the whole matter, matter to the civil authorities for arbitration. Now that sounds weird to us because of what we're going to talk about with the Anabaptists here shortly. But that was his methodology, and it was a revolutionary methodology of bringing about biblical change. Preach against those things that weren't in accordance with the scriptures. Wait till someone in the congregation complains about it. Take it to the civil magistrates, the authorities, and let them, you, you dispute it, and let them make the final decision. And he uh, embraced that mode of change and submitted himself to, to whatever the decisions were. Because Zwingli, why? He viewed the church and the state to be one entity. That's key. A Christian nation, and he was unwilling to oppose the rule of local civil authorities. When his original group of disciples began to disregard the civil authorities, particularly in regard to their refusal to have their children baptized, Zwingli joined the civil authorities in calling for their persecution and extermination. Okay? So he became their bitter enemies and personally supervised the, the judicial murder of some of his own disciples. Okay? Again, it's really hard to fathom. We, ju we just live on the other side of history. We're 500 years removed from this, and it's really hard for us to move backwards like that and to, and to understand how that could happen. But it was a it was <laughs> it was just downstream from from Constantine. You remember Constantine, way back in the fourth century, in the establishment of the Christian nation, that concept, and so it it has now developed for twelve hundred years. It's the paradigm. It's the only paradigm, really. And so it was just. The way they understood the world. The way they understood the world. Let me sh let me turn you. Um, it's page twenty eight, I think, in yours. You have that page twenty eight. Yep. Okay. Good. So this is probably a good place as any to look at this. This is the two competing understandings of the church and the state, and how they how they interrelate to each other, and in particular how the church itself. Is constructed. So on the left, we have the Corpus Christianium, or the body of Christianity, and this is the mainline Reformed um, approach. And then on the right, we have Corpus Christi, or the body of Christ, and this is the Anabaptist approach. We're going to talk about the Anabaptists for a good part of this evening. So notice here on the on um, as you as you're working down and comparing, you'll see that. That there's a, there's similarities at the top, and, but as it begins to filter down, then it begins to to um, move away from each other. So we you know have Christ as the resurrected head of the church, so they both agree to that. And then under it you have leaders, but the, but there's a difference in the leaders. So you see for the the reformed, it's it's those that are ordained to administer the sacraments. So there's this idea of being ordained and then the administration of the sacraments which convey grace. That is the, that is the Reformed view. And you notice on the left that this affirmation of the creed binds your conscience to the church. So they had creeds. You, you affirm the creed, and then by affirming the creed, you're bound to the church whose creed it is. As opposed to the Anabaptist approach, which is... Uh, the leaders of the church are ordained servants recognized based on their gifts and skills. So there's no authority in them, inherent in them, by virtue of their ordination. Their, their authority lies in, their, in the Word of God. Okay? And then at the bottom, you see the, the, the way the church is made up. So you have members equal subjects of a, of a sacral society. This is Wingley's understanding. This was Calvin's understanding. This was Luther's understanding. Okay? Now, Reformed churches today have been influenced by Anabaptists. They don't, they don't agree, <laughs> but they have, <laughs> because they wouldn't express it this way. 
Puritan New England would have. In the same way. So notice the equal sign. The members of the church equal the subjects of the society. The, those circles completely overlap. You enter into society by physical birth. You enter into the church through your uh, infant baptism. That becomes a, the gateway in. On the other side, uh, in the Anabaptist approach, the members equal believers. So the members of the church are believers, as opposed to everyone in society is a member of the church. You enter, the, the, you enter into the Anabaptist church through a profession of faith that is confirmed and made public in believers' baptism. Now, Modern evangelicalism has wandered uh, from this in the sense that uh, churches accept people into membership who are not baptized. They, they serve communion to people who are not baptized. Anabaptists would never do that. They would never do that. They would say, if you've not been baptized, you have no credible profession of allegiance to Christ. It is the, it is the entrance into it. Uh, it is because Edwards was trying to reform the church. And this is the problem with the reformed church is how do you, they want a pure church. How do you get a pure church if every member of, of the community is a member of the church? How, how do you, and, it, and even going, going back 500 years, how do you even do church discipline? Unless you just want to, I mean, you know, flog them, I suppose. You know, so those kinds of things happened. But yes, Edwards was trying to reform the church because of the, his grandfather's halfway covenant. So the halfway covenant was the notion that, that basically the children of believers who were baptized as infants, but later demonstrated themselves to be reprobate, were still somehow halfway in the church. And Edwards wanted to deny them access to the communion table. And in particular, he wanted to deny access to the communion table to a very prominent member of the congregation. And that was his undoing. But he was stuck with the same problem, is how do you purify a church when everybody's part of it? Anabaptists emphasized church purity, arguably perhaps to an extreme. We'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Okay? But they were, they were really focused on wanting to see a pure church. They had seen the problems of the mixed multitudes. And they didn't want any part of it. Okay. So, back to, uh, back to Zwingli. So, page 26. Zwingli is best known probably for his view on the Lord's Supper. He viewed the Lord's Supper as a memorial meal in opposition to the prevailing Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation and the Lutheran doctrine of consubstantiation. 1529, a meeting was arranged by Philip of Hesse, and it was designed to unite the two arms of the German Reformation, one headed by Luther, one headed by Zwingli. And they had this meeting. And there were 15 points of theology discussed at that meeting, and they agreed on 14 of the 15. Sounds promising. However, they were unable to agree on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. Their disagreement was so sharp over the issue of the Lord's Supper that all hope of a united German Reformation was shattered. I mean, Luther is banging his shoe on the table this is my body. I mean, he just, in his special way, was just not going to move on this, and Zwingli was not going to move either. And so, even though they agreed on 14 or 15, this was such an important issue. And again, it, it sounds a little funny to our ears. Is, is the Lord's table important? Yeah, it's very important. Is it treated 
in modern evangelicalism as important as it is? I think not. I think not. I mean, the Lord left two. <laughs> Baptism, which is our entrance into the fellowship, and communion, which is our celebration of the fellowship. He left us two. And yet, when the modern church in America, I can only speak to America, doesn't really value very high either of those. And, and as evidence, I present the reality that there are tons of churches filled with people who are not baptized, yet profess, profess to be followers of Christ, and the communion table itself is handled in a very sloppy way. This was the Marburg Colloquy, one of the darkest times in the history of the Reformation. We just think, and God doesn't make any mistakes, I understand. But just think, if somehow the German Reformation could have been united, it would have completely changed the face of Europe. Okay, Luther's consubstantiation. What was Luther's view of communion? Confused. Okay. Christ is physically present, and this is the best he could come up with, in, under, and with the elements. Okay, in, under, and with. Zwingli's view is that Christ is in heaven, <laughs> sitting at the right hand of the Father. Thus, communion is a symbol, sign, or memorial. Okay, that's, that's the gist of his argument. That the incarnation was a one-way street. <laughs> Calvin's view is what's called a real presence or a real reception of the body and blood of Christ, but only in a spiritual sense. So to take of the elements, according to Calvin, is to actually um, really receive the body and blood of Christ, but spiritually, not physically. Right? The real presence view. Those are the basically the three main options that are available within Orthodox Christianity. Okay. Any questions? Um, well, Luther, you know, this is my body, right? Given for you, given for you. I understand, but it's emphasis on. A particular portion of it, or what it what it means, difference of opinion on what what its emphasis is, what it means. So for Luther, the, right? Yeah, John six is not a communion passage at all, but they turn it into one. By the way, it's not broken. It doesn't say broken. It does not say broken. No, in fact, John is very clear to say that his body is not broken. This is my body given for you. Not one bone was broken. Be that me. We're, we're, we're quibbling. <laughs> Truth is important. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. I mean, it, it is. And so what, what does it represent? I think it represents theological pre-commitments that flow into it. They're all reacting. Okay, so Zwingli was a Catholic priest as well as was Luther, as was Calvin training for it. And so they're all reacting to transubstantiation and saying that is out of bounds. It is not that. But it had been that for a long, long time. So now they're wrestling with what is it? So, you know, you could argue that Luther just couldn't, couldn't give up his, all of his Catholicism and he just couldn't get completely away from it. If you think Zwingli is right. If you, if you understand it, you know. What does that say, by the way, on that table? This do in remembrance of me. Well, Jesus did say that. But he also said, this is my body. This is my body. Sure. But you remember when we looked at, at Roman, at transubstantiation and the miracle of of the transubstantiation, it's the Aristotelian philosophy underneath it, the incidentals and the universals, 
So it appears still as bread and wine to the senses, but in reality, it is the flesh and blood. And it's a re-sacrifice. That's Roman Catholic theology. Luther says, ah, it's not that. <laughs> it's, well, what is it, Martin? Well, it's, it's physically present in, under, and with. Aha, Aha I understand. I don't understand. And they don't understand. I mean, they can't go any further than that because they don't really know. It's a mystery. That's the next thing they'll say. It's a mystery. For, for Zwingli, it's, his argument was this. Christ is, was a, uh, resurrected bodily. He ascended bodily. He sits at the right hand of the Father bodily. How could he possibly be anything more than, than it's a remembrance of him? No, and I don't think that's what they were reacting to. I think they were reacting to his call for absolute Loyalty and commitment. That's what they were walking from. So, yeah, they never charged him with being a cannibal. That, that would really just divided over personal opinion, which is sad. Because it is sad. There's no biblical basis for their position. Right. If we were to do a poll, it would be interesting. All right, let's take a minute and do it. Okay. How many have a Lutheran view of, of the Lord's table? Because I mean, these are all within the boundaries of orthodoxy. Anybody? Okay, no takers. How, about he, how many are Zwinglian in their understanding? That's what I figured. Yeah. How many are, are uh, real present? Calvin. A few of you guys, yeah. Yeah, I bounce, honestly. I bounce between Calvin and Zwingli. Yeah, and sometimes it's really hard. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe I'm... Well, hold on. It, it, the sloppiness may be me. Let me, let me look ahead myself. Well, one is spiritually present, the other is physically present, but yeah. You know, and I may have um I may have misspoken there. I'll have to, I'll, I'll have to check. Uh real presence. Is that Calvin's? Or am I confusing Luther with that? Yeah. Spiritual presence, maybe that's it. Okay. Spiritual presence. Yes. That's right. In this, uh, and I would say in, in a similar to fashion to the reading of the Scriptures, that something actually spiritually does happen when we read the Scriptures with a believing heart. Yeah, and the same for the sacraments, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not the Catholic idea that it's conveying grace ex opera operato, but it's... Um, the Spirit of God is at work in these things. <laughs> and he's, wor he's working in us through them. Yeah. Thus Paul's warning in Romans 10. Because he saw it on the horizon. All right, let's talk about the Anabaptists. Because you have been profoundly influenced by them, but you probably know very little about them. History is written by the winners. Remember that. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about the Anabaptists. So we're on page 27. The Anabaptists have historically received a less than favorable treatment by church historians. My understanding of the Anabaptists in my first 15 years as a believer was I kind of looked at them sideways. Thought they were just very fringe, and really, it wasn't until seminary and I took a an elective in Anabaptist theology and was introduced to their writings and reading what they actually wrote and said and so forth that my uh, they rose so much in my estimation. Uh, still, plenty of flaws for sure, but they got some things really right, and they were serious-minded men. So. This is in part due to the number of church histories that have been written by men from a Reformed tradition and the human tendency to want to lump people and groups together for ease of identification and classification. Okay. The Anabaptists, because they were persecuted by both the Catholics and the magisterial reformers. Now, that term magisterial reformer, uh, have we defined that yet? Have we use that? Okay, so what is a magistrate? Someone in authority in the role of a judge or a sheriff is a magistrate, that kind of an idea. Keeps the law, adjudicates the law. 
So a magisterial reformer is one who who uh, was aligned with and even enlisted the magistrate in the in the reformation of the Catholic Church and the administration of the Protestant Church. So Zwingli is a magisterial reformer. Calvin's a magisterial reformer. Luther as well. They all appealed to the magistrate at some point in their um, theological disputation to come alongside them and basically be their muscle to make it happen. Okay? Those are the magisterial reformers. Uh, Because they were persecuted by both Catholics and the magisterial reformers, they had little opportunity to develop their theology or commit it to writing. It's really hard to write good and deep theology when you're moving from place to place to avoid capture, torture, and death. And many of them uh, did not live long. Once they were converted, they did not live long. There's a there's Fox's Book of Martyrs. Have we talked about that? If you're familiar with Fox's Book of Martyrs, yay thick. It's a history of the martyrs. It's definitely an anti-Catholic history of the martyrs. Uh, of the martyrs. It's still it's, it's a very good read. I would recommend it. Um, but there is a far thicker one called the Martyrs' Mirror, and it is the history of the Anabaptist martyrs, and they have kept very careful records. And it's I used to own it. Um, I gave it away uh, some years ago, but it was, it's like yay thick, and it's big. There's just been tons of them. And so it's something they take seriously and keep good records on. So here we go, some background. So let's look first at... Um, NSA, they are always listening to me. (laughs) Buy Bitcoin. Buy Bitcoin. All right. So, Conrad Grable. Okay, so let's just resolve this once and for all. They all have cool hats. And the reason they have cool hats is because they lack central heat. Uh, well, many of them it was a bald pate, yes. They lack central heat. They are Northern Europeans. It's cold. <laughs> and so they resorted to hats in the house, in the house, all the time. Okay? That's why they're always in hats. It's, that was the way that you kept from catching, the, you know, catching cold and getting pneumonia. All right. So Anabaptist, and the word means rebaptizer. It's it was applied to them by their enemies. It is not a term they adopted themselves. They would say they are not rebaptizers because they don't believe their initial infant baptism was a valid biblical baptism. So they would say they are not being rebaptized, they are being baptized the first time. Okay, so just understand that. The movement began on January 21st, 1525, in Zurich, Switzerland when a small group of Zwingli's disciples refused to have their children baptized and then proceeded to baptize each other in accordance with what they believed to be Christ's command. Grable baptized George Blaurock, the first, this is the first Anabaptist baptism. It was done in, in um, uh, I don't remember if it was um, Grable's home or not, but it was there in Zurich, and it was done by pouring a relatively small quantity of water on his head with a basin to catch it underneath. So the idea that they were immersed and all of that, that is um, something later. So it was done by pouring. And in fact, I think Mennonites baptized by pouring as well, I believe, still. Pretty sure that's true. Okay, So the idea of of immersion coming from the, the, the Greek word for baptize and so forth, is a more of a Baptist orientation as opposed to an Anabaptist orientation. Okay. The Anabaptists rejected the names given them since they believed their own infant baptism was invalid. Now, they were linked by their persecutors to the Donatists in the 4th century, which provided the ecclesiastical and civil justification to oppress them. Now, do you remember the Donatists? Turn back to page 11 in your syllabus and be reminded not the Donatists. I'm 
right in the middle of page 11. Schismatic movement originating in North Africa, growing out of the Diocletian persecution, corruption in the church, and the handing over the bishop by the bishops of the copies of the scriptures to be burned in order to avoid persecution led to this schism. Dantism lasted until the 7th century, and they were wiped out by the Muslim conquest of North Africa. Donatists believed in freedom of conscience, separation of church and state, a regenerate church membership, purity of the church, that is the practice of church discipline, and a rejection of infant baptism. The Donatists. One of their chief opponents was Augustine, who developed the Catholic theory of the invisible church in the midst of a visible society. Okay? So, The allegation against the Anabaptists was that this was the old Donatist heresy rearing its ugly head again. And that provided the justification they needed to persecute. And so they did. They did. They hunted them down. A number of them they drowned. They said, you want to be baptized? We'll arrange for it. And they would tie a big stone around them and throw them over the, overboard, drown them. Although severely persecuted, they were not wiped out, and our ancestors, the modern brethren and Mennonite groups. Okay? I think many of us have had intersections with brethren groups and Mennonite groups. Okay? Those are um, their theological roots go back to the Anabaptist movement. Now, let's see. Let me just, you know, if somebody wants this, I can provide it to you. It's just a, it's a little biography I wrote up on Conrad Grable. Uh, let's see, how do we excerpt this? Well, let's just do it this way. Uh, the Faithful Night, January 21st, 1525. Uh, Grable, Mance, George Blaurock, and several others gathered in the home of Mance's mother. Okay, there it was. Mance's mother to defy the orders of the council. And that night, at the urging of Blaurock, Grable baptized him, and then Blaurock in turn baptized all the others present. And they thus formed the first believers' church of Zurich. That's 1525. For the next 18 months, things moved rapidly for Grable and his two friends, Blaurock and Mance. They fled Zurich, traveled the countryside, preaching and baptizing in accordance with their new understanding of the scriptures. Later in the summer of 1525, Grable, Mance, and Blaurock were arrested in the town of Grunningen, east of Zurich, and brought back to Zurich to face trial after a public disputation with Zwingli, at which many of the population spoke out in favor of Grable. The three were subjected to two trials on the charge of rebellion against political authority. Okay, so that was the charge. The three men were found guilty and condemned to life imprisonment. After a short while, the three escaped via a door that had been mysteriously left open and fled the city, preaching in the surrounding countryside and townships. Their newfound freedom was short-lived. However, Mance was rearrested in late 1526, was drowned by the authorities in the Limit, Limmat River outside Zurich, January 25, 1527. Blarock was later arrested in Tyrol, where he was burned at the stake in 1529. Grable died from the plague while in exile in the summer of 1526. So you can see they all had rather short careers. Now, before we uh, get to their fundamental beliefs, I want to just speak to you about one other thing. So there's this fellow here. You see him? Yeah, no hat in that picture. Yeah, no kidding. That is a representation of Michael Sattler. Okay, Michael Sattler. So, what do we know about Michael Sattler? Well, Michael Sattler was a Catholic priest who his conscience was seriously bothering him about all of that. And he had a friend who was a nun whose conscience was bothering her. 
They were in love with one another, and they both left the church and were wed. He wandered, and uh, as a, um, you know, what do you call that? Weaver making cloth, and he stumbled across the Anabaptists, heard them preach, was converted to Anabaptism, and became a significant figure in the movement in its very early time. He provided the theological lift for really the earliest and arguably the most significant doctrinal confession of the Anabaptist movement. And it's called the, the uh, Seven Articles of the Schleitheim Confession. From, it dates from 1527. So you can see it's really early on. It's short. Why is it a, why is it a short confession? Um, you know, because, well, <laughs> they didn't have a lot of time in one place. And so he just kind of jotted these things down as quickly as he, as he could, but it provides shape to, to Anabaptist, the Anabaptist movement. It gave them a theological footing to move forward on. They were very active evangelists and successful in that sense, which only infuriated the authorities, as you can imagine. So the seven articles of the Slight Time Confession, authored by Michael Sattler, were baptism, so believer's baptism, then we called the ban. The ban was church discipline, okay? And um, they referenced Matthew 18 in support of this and so forth. Uh, they were so insistent on a pure church that if a wife's husband proved, according to Matthew 18, you know, the process of Matthew 18 was then put out of the church as an unbeliever, under the ban, she would no longer be permitted to sleep with him as his wife. So that's how seriously they they took it, okay? Even right into the marital chamber. So the ban, the practice of the Lord's Supper with a Zwinglian understanding of it. Uh, separation. So the separation of um, of the church and state. So they, he, they talk about, um, well, let's see if I can summarize this quickly. We have been united concerning separation that shall take place from the evil and wickedness which the devil has planted in the world. We have no fellowship with them and do not run with them in the confusion of their abominations. Now there is nothing else in the world and all creation than good or evil, believing and unbelieving, darkness and light. The world and those who are out of this, out of the world, God's temple and idols, Christ and Belial, none will have a part with the other. To us, then, the commandment of the Lord is so is also obvious, whereby He orders us to be, and to become separated from the evil one, and thus He will be our God, and we shall be His sons and daughters. Furthermore, He admonishes us, therefore, to go out from Babylon and from the earthly Egypt, though we may not be partakers in their torment and suffering, which the Lord will bring upon them. From all this. We should learn that everything which has not been united with our God in Christ is nothing but an abomination that we should shun. By this are meant all popish and repopish works and idolatry, gatherings, church attendance, wine houses, guarantees, and commitments of unbelief, and other things of the kind which the world regards highly and yet which are carnal or flatter, um, flatly contrary to the command of God after the pattern of all iniquity which is in the world. From all this we shall be separated and have no part with it. So it's the idea of being separated from worldliness. That was Sattler's writing. This is Sattler's writing. Yep. Okay, so the emphasis on separation from worldliness. Um, the idea of, of a pastor as a shepherd of a local congregation. So, you know, think back to that chart with the uh, Corpus Christi and uh, Corpus Christianium, the, the idea of an ordained pastorate and then a, a, a pastor a pastor chosen based on giftedness and so forth. Okay, so they emphasize the, the role of the shepherd pastor in the congregation. The, um, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the repudiation of the sword. So what they said, and I won't read it to you, but basically is that the sword was given by God to civil authorities to punish evil, and that is by God, but it is not given to the church. 
and therefore they believe that they should abstain from the use of the sword. So this is where the idea of pacifism and so forth comes from. They they um, would not serve as as a civil in a civil authority. So they wouldn't serve in civil government. They they would not uh, serve in the military. They would not raise arms against another. Um, all of those kinds of ideas are wrapped up in the idea of that the sword was given by God to the magistrate, and the magistrate is in the is a is a worldly thing that's passing with this world, and is and the Christian is to have no part in it. So it's very much a separation of the believers from the political realm. Okay, does that sound familiar to you at all? It ought to, because there's certain sections of the evangelical church who still very much believe that. Okay, and uh, they wouldn't. Uh, there's no self-defense involved, and in, you know all of that kind of flows out of it. And then the last was um, the denial of the oath. So they would refuse to take an oath, to swear an oath. They said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. All else is of the evil one. Okay, So they took it very literally and just said, oaths are out. No oath keeping. Or, or making, rather. Okay, So that's the seven articles of their confession. So uh, Michael Sattler was born in 1490. He died in 1527, a young man. Uh, let's see. In May of 1527, he was arrested by arrested by Austrian authorities along with his wife and several other Anabaptists. He was kept prisoner. Uh, Catholic ruler of Austria, Archduke Ferdinand, urged that Sattler be immediately executed by drowning due to his prominence in the Anabaptist movement. However, the Elector of Brandenburg had an interest in due process and wanted to undergo trial procedure. So they assembled Catholic theologians, 24 judges, and he was tried. He was charged with defying the emperor, rejecting the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. At his uh, trial, by the way, he, um, at that time, the Turks, um, which was the Muslims, were pressing, were pressuring Europe, and um, uh, and because the Anabaptists would uh, would not serve in military service because of the their what was called pacifistic approach to that uh, they were considered threats to the to the security of the state and so that was one of the one of his um, the charges against him was that basically they were subversive uh, he rejected the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist rejected infant baptism rejected extreme unction dishonored the saints teach taught against oaths practicing the love feast marrying and advocating non-resistance. Those were the charges. Sadler denied that he divided the imperial edicts or dishonored the saints, but defended the remaining charges as moral and biblical. He also denied that courts should have jurisdiction in religious doc, uh, doctrine. Okay. So he just said, you know what, this whole court's illegitimate. He was convicted, sentenced to execution, it was read as follows. Michael Sattler shall be committed to the executioner. The latter shall take him to the square and there first cut out his tongue and then forge him fast to a wagon and there with glowing iron tongs twice tear pieces from his body. Then on the way to the site of execution five times more as above and then burn his body to powder as an arch heretic. The other men in the group were executed by the sword and the women including Margarita his wife were executed by drowning. And thus, Michael Sattler passed into the presence of his Lord. Okay? So, these guys were serious men. Serious men. Here on page 27, let's just kind of close it out by this. The fundamental beliefs characterizes them as follows. Each directly confronts the state church model that had been in existence since Constantine. So pacifism. Believing that the power of the sword was left by God only to civil authorities and that within the church Christ had taught a way of patience and long-suffering, the Anabaptists refused to take up arms against their enemies. At a time when the Muslim Turks were threatening Europe's borders, the pacifism of Anabaptists was seen as a threat to the survival of the state. Okay, So they were conscientious objectors. 
Voluntary church membership. Believing that the New Testament taught a church made up of people converted by God into disciples of Christ, the Anabaptists rejected the prevailing state church model which compelled people to join the church. In addition, they practiced church discipline and the ban, putting out of their fellowship those who were unwilling to live in obedience to the scriptures. The state church believed that the idea of a voluntary church membership was a threat to the unity of society. In other words, if you could opt out of the state church, that was considered a threat to societal union. And and you can kind of think back to, to way back to the council at Nicaea. Remember, that was called in 325 by Constantine. And do you remember why it was called? It was called because, not because Constantine was concerned about the deity of Christ so much as he was concerned about unity of his empire and the dispute between the Arians and um, Athanasius and, and, you know, the believers was so um, tearing at the empire that he, he was afraid he'd lose it, that it would descend into chaos. And so he called the council and enforced unity. He cared less about what position the unity was around as the fact that everybody agrees. And so that is the prevailing paradigm. Again, it's hard for us because we just don't live in... America was not founded under those kinds of principles. In part, as a rejection, uh, you know, it was founded by Europeans who looked back on a thousand years of European history and said, man, this thing's a bloody mess. These people are always killing each other. We need a different way to do, to do this. We, we've got to establish some walls of separation between the state and the church because if we have a state church the same problems are going to rear their ugly head all over again. So they set the country up this way. Not freedom from the church or freedom from religion, but a freedom of religion. Believer's baptism. Believing the scriptures commanded baptism as a sign of one's inward conversion, they baptized only those who could articulate a faith in Christ. The state church saw this as schismatic and a revival of the old Donatist heresy. And then, finally, Scripture as sole authority. They preached, and each one diligently attempted to practice this principle, but like those before and after, they developed their own layers of human tradition over the Scriptures. Okay? But they started out, at least initially, with sola scriptura. Okay? So, those are the, those are the Anabaptists. Uh, they're, it's a, they're fascinating to, to study. Uh, the development and to see how much it's influenced our church experience, the vast majority of us. Okay, because as I read those things, you're kind of going, "Yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right." We agree with these things. We agree with these things. Okay, within the Reformation, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and that's true because we are, we are wonderfully, tremendously, and profoundly indebted to the magisterial reformers in that they got soteriology right. They recovered the gospel from the, uh, from the barnacles of Roman Catholicism that had encrusted it for the last thousand years. And without getting the gospel right, you got nothing. So we are profoundly uh, grateful for that. But I think with the perspective of history looking back, we would say they didn't go far enough. They didn't reform enough. They still hung on to things that they should have let go of. And they were blind to see it. And it took another group to come along who were willing to die <laughs> for what they saw as truth to say, you know what? Hey, there's more to this reformation that needs to be fixed. So would that God would grant us that kind of, of um, passion for the truth, we would, we would be willing to put it all out for it. So, okay, good. Questions, comments? Okay, that's good. Finish up the last two chapters in the book. Sorry about the feminists. You'll just have to endure it. And then be thankful to the Lord you're not married to one. Okay? 
and then uh, and then come back and we'll take up John Calvin next week. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.